So I just wanted to say um, welcome to everybody. My name is Brooke Scarborough and I am with Lincoln Military Housing and uh, we have invited um, our friends over at USAA to come um, join us today to present some information on financial readiness. This is the first part of a two-part series. Um, if you're available on the 21st, they will be joining us again for a webinar to go through um, a similar format and style in regards to um, finances during a uh, pandemic. So that's gonna be a great one. I think we all can get some valuable information from that in addition to today's um, overview. So I am gonna introduce Joel Vargas and JJ Montero. They are with USAA and they are actually going to be our hosts for today and we'll be answering any questions that anybody has. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules we will have everybody muted however we have a chat box so we'll be answering questions as we go and then we will also open up the call for some questions at the end so I am going to turn it over to you Joel and we can go ahead and get started well thanks very much book I appreciate it and, and honestly uh, to military uh, Lincoln military housing to you the staff there thank you so much for having us and inviting us and giving us the opportunity to do this uh, we really, really enjoy the opportunity to speak to folks and just just offer some kind of uh, soup to nuts uh, information, so to speak, on financial readiness. Uh, some people, for some people, this may be, uh, you know, some people may be at a higher level. Some people may be at what I like to call the ground level here when we start talking about this. But the key takeaway here is that it's always good to kind of refresh your memory on financial readiness. Even if you have a good plan in place, it's always good to kind of take a look at this and see where you're at. For those that have it, then you know this is probably a good way to start, and maybe start a some creative thinking on what we can do uh, for your people, what you can do for your future. So, uh, with that said, it says on there my name, Joe Vargas. I'm retired Navy Lieutenant Commander. Started as a young E1, worked my way up the ranks to Chief Petty Officer, then went through the Warrant Officer ranks in the Navy, uh, and then finally went into the Navy LDO ranks, and uh, kind of ran out of time just over 30 years. I have to call it quick. So, uh, it was a lot of fun, a great ride, but I worked in naval aviation the entire time. And it was probably the highlight of my life, honestly, being in the military and serving. Uh, I had the honor of having J.J. Montanero here, who's our certified financial planner. Uh, J.J., also, unless you want to yourself, J.J., you'd like to talk a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Th thanks, Joel. I'm actually, uh, my, so my dad was Navy, so I have a little bit of that connection, but uh, I'm actually an Army guy. I uh, went to West Point, spent about six years on active duty, and then uh, got out, and I did stay and retire from the Army Reserve, but I uh, got into financial planning. So I've been at USA a whopping, uh, I was looking at the other day, 18 years, which is a long time. Most of that time, we're working with members and families, doing uh, financial planning. Now I'm on the uh, military advocacy team, so I'm on Joel's team, and get the opportunity to do some writing and, and talking. So we're, we're fired up to be here. Uh, no question goes unanswered. I'm going to be in the chat box, so if you have questions, uh, feel free to write them there. Some of those, Joel, I'll bring up to you. Some of them I'll just go ahead and answer right there in the chat box. But uh, we're excited uh, to be talking finances, and uh, it's been an interesting time. I think uh, when you look at it, Joel said of having a plan, but I, I think when you look at uh, what's been going on, it's uh, certainly unprecedented, and we all like to anchor something or some experience that we've had in the past to be able to, to deal with and, and reckon with what's right in our face. And this is uh, something that uh, none of us and so it's one positive of this is Joel and I've been able to get out and do a lot of these type of events where we're getting the opportunity to meet people that uh, we don't normally get to meet. So I'm uh, thankful for that opportunity and thankful to be here with you guys. Thanks, JJ. Appreciate that. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, bottom line, like I was telling you guys, I started out as a young E1 in the, in the military. So when we talk about financial readiness, I, I lived that uh, a whole lot in my early years in the military. I, you know, I grew up in New York City in the Bronx, so my parents, the paradigm then wasn't to teach me about financial readiness. I had no idea how to save money, put money away, invest. Uh, and, and really the, uh, the paradigm, at least the shift thinking back then was, hey, if you had money, it was already spent. And if you had food on the table, make sure you eat that meal because you don't know what's going to be on the table tomorrow. Uh, so those kind of things kind of changed a little bit through the years. I've been very fortunate to have made some smart decisions along the way to to listen to some of the guidance that I was provided later on in my years, which has paid off. So hopefully by hearing some of this, it will kind of, it will reinvigorate some folks to rethink your budget, rethink your plan 
and do some great stuff for your future. So with that said, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the, to the next slide here. Uh, this is our disclosure and essentially all the stuff that's written on this is just saying that we're not here to endorse any products, not at all. We're here to talk about basic financial readiness, things that you can apply with any institution you're with. Uh, I'm here to tell you you need to be with us. Uh, that's not, the, that's not the, the intent of this brief. It's simply to educate, to provide you some uh, sources of information that you could apply it to your everyday stuff that you do with your own financial institution. So uh, we won't answer questions about you know, giving financial advice, and we certainly won't try to tell you who to go with, but that's your decision. Certainly, again, use the information for your advantage. Uh, this is our mission, and our mission is pretty much tied very similar to the military, if you think about it. Uh, we, you know, and, and I think the key thing there is we always seek to breathe and provide a choice for the military community, uh, but more importantly, it's to facilitate the financial security of our members, associates, and families. That, to us, is probably the most crucial part of our uh, mission statement because it's not so much that we want to be your provider, but we want to make sure that you can sustain and can kind of live a good life beyond your military years or, or into your retirement. Our core values are closely tied to the military. Ours are service, loyalty, honesty, integrity. If you think about the Navy, they talk honor, courage, commitment. The Air Force has similar values, Army, uh, Coast Guard, Marines. We all tie all together to similar core values. And that's pretty much what takes us into our, into our mission, that guides us through our mission. Certainly our brand pillar is talking about our shared military values. We know what it means to serve is what we talk about, right? Uh, and that's just the wisdom is a strong pillar for us, and certainly our passionate member advocacy. I think we talked to some of our members that have been doing business with us or have been with USA. They'll tell you that they're pretty happy with what's going on. Uh, but most importantly, we like to stick to that mission because that is what guides us. That's what tells us what we need to do. So in this agenda today, we're going to talk, uh, and if I could back up just a little bit, just remember USA has been around for about 90, 90 plus years. In fact, in two more years, we'll be celebrating 100 years. And uh, it started out with 25 Army officers that couldn't get insurance, right, because they just didn't know how to insure them. And, what, and uh, they would insure each other, basically. They insured each other. And after they used that money to insure each other, whatever was left over at the end of the year, they would divide amongst themselves equally. Uh, so that morphed into the company that is today with roughly 13 million members. And we're still giving back in the sense, in the form of dividends and, and rewards and, uh, and some of the items that we give back at the end of the year through your insurance policy. So kind of the, the mission continues. It started out that way, but it's morphed into a bigger thing for us. And we, we're pretty proud of that. Uh, so again, in the agenda, we're going to talk about the agenda. The agenda in financial goals, we're going to talk about a few things. Uh, what are goals, financial goals? Well, it's the motivation that keeps us going, right? You set a goal, you have the motivation to start going, you set that goal for yourself with something in mind that you want to accomplish. Uh, it's pretty much the proverbial pot of gold, so to speak, that you're working towards. Uh, in effective budgeting, uh, you know, everyone here, unless you are a lottery winner, everyone here is gonna have to budget in some way or means, right? Uh, and you're gonna have to set some budgeting goals for yourself. Uh, so what we look at it here is, it's basically what comes in, uh, what comes out of your money and what comes in, right? The money coming in, money coming out. And you have to know what that is in order to effectively budget. Uh, with managing credit and debt, uh, you know, we're talking about credit and debt is, is credit is how you manage and how it shows up in different parts of your life, right? And debt is obviously what you owe. So we're going to talk about those things today as well. Under the protection and insurance part, uh, you know, things happen in life, right? We know there are going to be some emergencies and you need to be prepared for them. We certainly don't want to leave that burden on our loved ones if we leave uh, for them to take care of things uh, and they can't afford to do that. So we want to make sure we take care of that and we build to that for their future as well. Under the saving and investing piece, which is a pretty exciting part as well, uh, although they're not exactly the same, uh, but both of them need to be included in your plan, right? Because either way, you know, the, the, like we like to say the term, the early bird gets the worm. So making sure that you're watching what you're doing and investing the right way and building towards that future is a smart way to go. Now in financial goals, the first thing we're going to talk about is, uh, is the, the financial goals, which is pretty much a plan, right? It's, it's, it's the plan that you build uh, and, and you want to make sure that it starts with an objective of your finances. What is it that you're trying to achieve? Uh, you know, in military operations, we always have a goal in mind when we deploy. 
And that goal may be to go to a certain area and, and, and do whatever you need to do in that area, right? Accomplishing that goal is going to take planning and strategy and tactics. Kind of the same concept when you think about financial goals. You set that financial goal with an end game in mind and you fuel it so that you can reach that end game. Uh, some of the things to think about here are the SMART concept, the word, the acronym SMART. Uh, this is what motivates the financial goal. If you apply to this, uh, you need to think about something specific, right? When you build that financial goal, make sure it's something that you know you want. Maybe a specific item might be, hey, next year I want to go ahead and purchase a practical car and I want to have a down payment for that car of X amount. Well, you build to that. You make it measurable, right? Is it something that you know you're going to be able to look at and say, okay, at, at three months in, here's what I'm at. At six months in, this is where I'm at. At nine months, and then finally at that year, where am I at? Make it achievable, okay? If you make these goals achievable, it works in your favor because now it motivates you to build on other goals as well. But you have to have those little successes to kind of keep you motivated. So again, don't make a goal so big that you can't get to it or achieve it. Make small goals at first and then build to larger ones. And certainly make it relevant. You need that car to get around. And I can tell you in most installations, you do need a car to get around. So uh, even with the time of Uber and, uh, and Lyft and all that, we still most like, you know, in most cases, we want to have our car to get around. We need emergencies or anything that comes up. So make it relevant to something you need now. And certainly set a time on it. Make it time bound to where, okay, again, a year from now, this is where I plan to be. And, and go for that goal. So applying the SMART concept or the, 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 SMART, the acronym of SMART is always a good thing. Uh, think about things that will continue to motivate you through those goals, okay? Sticky notes. I'm a uh, visual guy, right? So I like to look little sticky notes on things that I'm trying to accomplish and I reflect on those. I build a spreadsheet and I look at that spreadsheet from time to time to track what I'm doing. Share them with someone close to you. If, you're, if it's you and your spouse making the plan, Share them with each other. Talk about where you're at in those goals. Make that part of your conversation. And then conduct check-ins with each other. Maybe your spouse is trying to strive for a goal and you're trying to work on another goal and you have joint goals going together. Challenge each other to meet those goals. Be accountable to each other as well. Uh, but mainly I want you to think about is what is it that you want to get done, right? How much money is it that you need to get there and when do you need it? And that kind of falls into those things about specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and the time bound. Any questions on that? Oh, JJ, you have anything else on that? No, no I think that was good, Joy. You were, you were uh, I mean, essentially talking about the, the, the why when you talk about budgeting or managing credit or, or saving for retirement. You have that when you have that pot of gold at the end of the uh, rainbow, it makes a big difference. I was, uh, I think, in the earlier session, we were talking about uh, how one of the things that we do at our house just to make sure that um, that we're on track is is we nickname all the ones. So I have a uh, a savings account. It's called house fund. So for everything that are house projects, each pay period, my wife and I both put money in the house fund. We have a Vegas. And we make a lot about what happens to that money, but we make an annual trip out with my family to, to Vegas. And, and so I fund that throughout the year with uh, periodic payments. And so just nicknaming the accounts with those names makes it uh, to me more real and uh, harder to, uh, to tap into that money. Yeah, if, if, I, if it just says savings, yeah, I could pull that money out and go do something with it. But if it says Michaela graduation fund, all of a sudden there's some, real meaning to it and I don't necessarily want to do it or use it for anything but the goal. So I, I think uh, too often the people that I've worked with over the years, you say goals, what do you use? And they're kind of vague and they don't, or, or they don't have any goals. So I think that's a great start point uh, for everyone is to have those goals. Thanks, Joel. Awesome. Thank you. And, and that's, that's pretty much, uh, that's exactly what I do. I name my accounts whenever I'm trying to save for something. It kind of keeps me visually uh, targeted on that. And I go, okay, that's what I'm going for right now. That's what you need to build to. And it, it does work. It really does work. So thank you, JJ. All right. So in, in effective budgeting, some stuff to think about. Uh, bottom line, budgeting allows you to achieve your goals. Okay. It's pretty much, you know, the word that when you say budgeting, people look at you like, oh, budget. Wow. Uh, you know, or even if you have the question, do you have one? And people tend to scratch their head and wonder. Uh, no, nah, not necessarily. In fact, some people don't even know how to budget. I was one of them. Uh, but I will tell you, you should smile because this is how you map out your strategy 
for, for the finances, okay? This is what you do to map out everything that you want to do on what you want to achieve. Uh, it provides a means to achieve those financial goals. Uh, and remember, we, we use the term that it's a noun and it's also a verb, right? It describes something, but it's also an action item. So you kind of got to put that in perspective of what the budget is. Uh, it's more important for you to have that knowledge as you move that into action and understand what the budget is about. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about this a little bit, but keep in mind that still one third of our membership lives payday to payday. You know, and that's because some people don't have a budget. People haven't created an effective budget or they have a financial goal, but they haven't put the budget in place to kind of get that uh, financial goal in place for them. So, you know, we don't want you to be there. We want you to be on the upper spectrum of that. Okay. Uh, next year. Sorry. Uh, so here we talk about the four step budgeting process and the four step budgeting process. You, you, you need to know where your money goes. That's the more important, the more, one of the most important things in there. Know where it should go and certainly develop, develop the spending plan. And we're going to show you a, a copy of that spending plan or what you, what you should be able to use to develop a spending plan. And then the hardest part really is staying on track, right? Being a disciplined person when you're in that four-step process and following that budget. And there's ways to do that. We'll talk about some ways to do that here in a little bit. But I want your eyes to gravitate towards that pie chart there so you can kind of get an idea. Although all those numbers don't add up to 100%, the idea here is that those percentages come into play on your personal finances, whether it be credit cards, taxes, utilities, your auto expenses can be anywhere from 9 to 10%, entertainment. You know, it doesn't mean because you have a budget that you should stop treating yourself to some some good things in life a little bit, but maybe you want to tailor them down and effectively budget so that you could do things from time to time while you have that budget and that plan in place. So kind of, that's a good illustration of that, but bottom line, this sheet right here is what's going to give you that, that, uh, that opportunity to take a look at everything. So, you know, and this is one version of the sheet. If you could tell here, there are apps and online tools that you could use to do the same kind of tracking. Uh, we offer this as a thing to look at for, for to be able to look and say, hey, pen and paper your stuff in and take a look at your budget and build it month to month so you can see what you're doing. Uh, you want to track your income. A good way to do that, to start a budget if you haven't done it much before, is track your income from 30 to, from 30 to 60 days. You know, do it 30 to 60 days, then roll into a semi-annual and then an annual budget and take a look at where you're at you're going to find a lot of expenses that you have along the way are expenses you probably didn't need to have before, or you may be able to tailor some of your expenses to kind of fuel that budget a little bit and work towards your financial goals. Uh, again, this is a good tool, but there are many tools out there that you could use. I'm still a spreadsheet guy. I still a pe I'm still a pen, paper, notepad guy. Any effective means that you could use, again, using the acronym SMART, okay? Now, we're going to talk about managing credit and debit and, and debt a little bit here. Uh, and I want to talk to you a little bit about this because, again, uh, two things that you really need to consider. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there that you could use to do this, but uh, let me see here. Number 10. Uh, it's basically a double-edged sword that we talk about, okay? It's good. Credit is good, but it's also bad, right? If you misuse credit, then you're going to put yourself in a really bad situation. So the idea here is not to use the credit to expand your lifestyle be beyond what you can actually afford. So you need to know you need to stay within those swim lanes when it comes to credit. So that hey, you Joel. Have hey, yeah, go ahead. And you're, you're on that topic. What, uh, Danielle had asked a question about, hey, should we, uh, should we have a credit card? Does that make sense to have? So as you're going through this, uh, put, that, put that question in the back of your mind. we Will do. I can answer that right now. I mean, the answer to that is well, most likely yes. You have to start somewhere. You have to have some level of credit. And we're going to talk about FICO score and all that here later, uh, and maybe even a strategy for having a credit card, a secured credit card that will help you get your FICO score up and maybe even build good habits as you go into the future. And then you can kind of get a different uh, a credit card on your own and not have to secure it. We'll talk about that here in a little bit too. But I just want you to think about, uh, you know, it does provide you a tool uh, to purchase items. You know, you have to, you have to, I'm sorry, going back. Uh, where am I at? Number 10. Sorry, I got a little sidetracked there. So you have to kind of remember that, that using credit, you got to be careful with it, right? Because you can use credit for you in a good way. You can have credit in a bad way. But we're going to talk about that here in a little bit of the next slide. So in this slide, we're going to talk about uh, your credit score. 
And so what is that credit score? It's a three-digit score, right? Anywhere from 300 to 850, 850 being the best score, 300 poly being the bottom line score. Somewhere in there, your credit starts to reflect on the positive. And I would say that's usually about the 600, 650 area. You are on an upward trend of your credit, and you probably will get some level of, of, of good interest rates and stuff when you're making purchases or even approvals. But the biggest thing to think about there is that you are considered a credit number. A credit score identifies you as a credit risk, right? Whether your number's high, then your credit risk is low. If your number's low, then your credit risk most likely is gonna be high. And that will dictate a whole lot of things as far as lenders making decisions. More importantly, the interest rates that you get. So if you ever had a kind of a credit score somewhere like in the maybe 600s and you go somewhere buy a car or go to purchase a car and then you go to the same dealership that another friend went and they said they got a lower interest rate, that may be the separating factor. They probably had a better credit score than you and were lower risk than you. Just an idea. Uh, it, does, it is for lenders to make decisions, whatever you do. Uh, you have three reports that you can pull to look at. It's from TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. And it's always recommended that you kind of pull those and take a look at them and really read it from top to bottom and make sure that all that information is in there correct. An example for me would have been some one time I stayed at my brother's house for a week when I transferred from Japan and somehow I became, his name was my alias and his address was one of my known addresses. Uh, and that took a, when I went to purchase a home, my second home actually, uh, that became an issue because I had all these things on my report that kind of messed around with my debt to income ratio and I had to get those corrected before I could get to purchase the home. So look at that stuff, look at it very closely because it is important. Uh, I'm going to tell you later where you can pull the reports from uh, and take a look at them and uh, we'll give you more details on that. Uh, so how do you manage it? Well, you know, and, and you can borrow. What does credit management matter? Sorry. Uh, the reason it matters is because you can borrow at a certain rate, right? We talked about those interest rates. They're going to look at that credit rate and say, hey, we'll go offer you a loan for a four-year term at this percentage. You know, they may say, we'll offer you another loan at this percentage because depending on what credit rating you are, they may extend that time out for you, but that interest rate is going to be pretty high. So be careful. Uh, it's considered when they when you go for auto insurance, when you go to purchase auto insurance, again, all, the auto insurance business or insurance business in general is a risk business, right? If you're a high risk person, it's probably going to cost you more. If you're a low risk person, it'll probably cost you a little less, or at least the standard rates. Security clearance, those that are in the military or working in government jobs where you require clearance, this is a huge, huge career killer. If your credit is hurt or is, 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 is in a bad shape, then the chances that you're either going to lose or not get the security clearance you need to maintain your job. So that's very critical there. And certainly during employment and housing, those credit, those risk factors or credit scores are considered heavily as well. So kind of keep that in mind as we go through this, okay? Uh, let's talk about the next one here, sorry. I'm trying to navigate through these slides a little. It's kind of, all right, here we go. Uh, so managing credit and debt, understanding your credit score. We just talked about that. You have to look at your score. You know that between 300, 850. One of the things we talk about uh, that you should be careful with, especially when it comes to credit, is co-signing. It says here co-sign with caution, and I can't stress that enough to you. We talked earlier today. Uh, JJ had an example, and so did I. Uh, you know, my son needed a co-sign, and I did that for him one day. But I made him sign a promissory note, and I had it notarized and everything because. This is a quick way to lose friends and make enemies in the family, quite frankly. No, you assume, understand that when you co-sign for someone, you assume that debt with that person. You take on that credit with that person. And if they default, you're going to be gravely affected as well on your, on your credit score. So I'm not sure that's where you want to be. Uh, something to consider, something to think about. You know, people are going to cry crocodile tears about this and, and say, hey, I really need your help. But at the end of the day, uh, I've seen cases. One of the one of the presentations I did uh, when we used to do them on the installations was a sailor that told me about her mother that pretty much came to her that was in dire need, and she immediately co-signed. The young lady came back to work, and I'm thinking within the first month, she said she was getting uh, calls because payments weren't being made, and now she was on tap to have to make them. Not only that, but it affected her security clearance, and she had to change what she actually got trained to do in the military because she could not have a clearance to do it. So 
uh, think about that when you're doing that for folks. This is going to affect you uh, a lot harder than, than you think. So again, with caution. Now to answer the question earlier about credit cards, there are options to help you. If you've never had a credit card and you do want to have one, a good way to start would be with that secured credit card. Uh, the secured credit card is an example would be the young one young, young another young lady I spoke to had a thousand dollars in a savings account. Well, she took five hundred from that savings account and earmarked it for a secured credit card with a five hundred dollar limit. What that does is that money that's in savings is not affected whatsoever. It's going to continue to accrue the same interest it would. There's no change to that money other than if by chance you default on making a payment on that credit card, the money is taken out by the institution from that money and pay on the card. What that does for you, it continues to keep your credit there, shows that you don't have a delinquency, and it helps keep your credit score climbing a little bit. That's a good tool to have, especially when you're on your first card and if you deploy or you go somewhere where you have limited bandwidth and you normally make your payments online, it's probably a good tool to have. But as you grow into this, then you're going to get to a point where you've already accustomed to paying your monthly payments. Hopefully you're paying more than the minimum. We'll talk about that. But uh, you're making your payments. You've built a little bit of a FICO score leverage there. Your risk looks good. And then maybe now you can get a credit card on your own, not have to secure it with something in the bank and you've got good payment habits, right? Uh, where you can review your uh, credit report, you can do that. Uh, you should do it quarterly. I'm sorry, you should re review your credit report quarterly. Uh, definitely a year in advance before making any pay major purchases. And annualcreditreport.com, which is where I still go to get my report, you can pull all three reports annually or you can pull one from each agency, Equifax, Experience, uh, and TransUnion, one a quarter. Uh, and then, you know, you'll have all that there. Again, it's not going to give you your FICO score through annualcreditreport.com. In fact, they don't ask you for a credit card number unless you ask to get a FICO score. So no need to do that because through your financial institution, you can get your FICO score for free. So remember that. But you don't need to have a credit card. You just plug in some information and it will give you uh, those reports so you can look at. Top to bottom, read them. It talks about your entire credit history. Uh, and in most cases, you can read through that and know that your FICO score is probably in pretty good shape. Uh, so great tool. I still use it to this day. Where are we at? All right. Any questions so far, JJ, coming this way? Yeah, there's, it, one, there's a question about uh, what, what's the best age to start building your kids' credit from uh, Gregory. Any, you want me to go? You want to yeah. give that a run? All right. So, so I'll, I'll start there. And, and Greg, I'll tell you what we did, because uh, obviously in terms of uh, your own kids, you certainly want what's best for them. So, so my kids, uh, they worked at Chick-fil-A and, and uh, Burger King growing up. And uh, one of the things not having anything to do with credit, we had them do is uh, they had that earned income. So they started putting money away in a Roth IRA. So Joel, talk about that later but as far as building credit uh, to me the, the earlier you can start the, the better and and so for our kids I thought it was really good we got them credit we had them jointly we got credit cards for them while they were in high school and I had I have three kids and uh, I batted uh, 667 so two of three worked out really well one not so much but in all cases it, it, there were good lessons learned the thing I liked about starting them early like that was because I could be looking over their shoulder because it wasn't just them on their own. It was, it was me uh, and, and their mom watching what they were doing with those credits, uh, steering them on course, and, uh, and they were starting to build that history and starting to understand the, the concept of credit. So earlier, Danielle had asked about, is a credit card a good idea? And, and Joel said, yes. And I think that's really true when it comes to credit scoring and because most of the models, when, when they're essentially, the, the, remember, credit scoring is all about the lender. It's not so much about you. It's about you in the eyes of the lender. Are you going to be trustworthy? Are you going to be somebody they want to lend money to? And, uh, and, and so through the eyes of a lender, uh, a credit card is a beautiful thing because what's the what's the requirement? What's causing you to to make those payments on time every time? Uh, it's not somebody coming to repossess your vehicle or foreclose on your house. There's really nothing there that they can that they can come and get. And so it's it's really 
you kind of your credit reputation is, is really what's, what's shown by responsible use of a credit card. So I think, uh, one, I think it's, I'm not telling you that you have to carry a balance or, uh, I'm, I'm just saying, get your foot in the door, use that type of tool and, and it will pay off in the long haul. So, so my answer would be early and uh, to Danielle, definitely. Yes. Thanks, JJ. You know, and a good, uh, at least for me, this is my wife and I, we, we, our strategy is simple. We have a credit card that we use for everyday expenses and we have it budgeted to a certain point where we use it. And then at the end of the month, we just make the whole payment in and keep it there. You're using the credit card, you're showing, and I'll show you here on the chart why that's important too. But, you know, it shows use of the credit card, relationship with the credit card company. At the end of the day, payments being made on time. Again, with the mindset of always pay more than the minimum. And I'll show you an illustration of that here along the way, too. Uh, but here is the... Uh, I'll go ahead, Daniel. Daniel. One more on that question. So Maricel asked, uh, are, are, the, are the FICO scores on mobile banking accurate? And, and, and so... So what I would say with that is we're talking about the FICO model and Joel described the 300 to 850, but, but the reality, when you talk about credit scores, there are literally hundreds, dozens, if not hundreds of different types of credit scores. So, so there, 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 are, there are models that mortgage lenders use, car or automobile, vehicle purchase. There are general scores, there are education scores. And, and so you could go to one place and see a score. And, and typically, directionally, they'll be the same from one place to another. So if you've get, if your bank, you've got a credit card and they tell you a score, that's probably directionally the same as you get elsewhere. But some scores will only use one of the credit bureau's data, and, and maybe not all lenders were that. Uh, bureau, so you can have actually different data that's used to create the scores. So there can definitely be variants from one score to another, no matter where you're getting it from. So that's just something to be aware of. We, we always joke I, I, that, that, yeah, th what's your score? And it's and, and if somebody told you you had a 200 score, that would be awful, right? Well, it would be in, in some models, but in in, in, in other models. There's a model that uh, that the folks at Experian have that goes from 1,200 is, is the is the worst score and 200 is the best. So so don't just think there's one score or three scores. But I think these factors that Joel's getting ready to talk to, if you if you follow these lines and are focused here, you'll be in good shape. Joel, thanks, JJ. All right. So in, in this year, managing credit and debit, there's credit score factors that need to be considered. And there's five of them here that that need to be looked at. So you know. The, the, the point here that we want to make is that 65% of the credit score is based on, on what you owe, owning it, owing as little as possible, excuse me, and making payments on time every time, right? So that's how your credit score factors are calculated. So let's review some of these real quick. If you look, the biggest portion there is your payment history, paying on time, set, you know, setting up auto payments and ensuring you don't miss a payment is a big factor here, right? They're going to look at that very closely. Uh, amounts owed. Debt versus your available credit line. It's the utilization radio ratio that you have. Uh, so you want to be at zero, but again, that's going to look, be looked at very closely. The length of the credit history. Long you have used credit or maintain the credit accounts, the better, right? No quick fixes. It's just about having that relationship with that credit card company or that loan agency or whatever and making sure that you're making those payments on time because that helps build that credit score. New credit. There's a difference, there's, there's things to look at that. Typically there's a hard look and there's a soft look, right? A soft look is for minor purchases. Maybe they need to make sure that you have at least decent credit and they'll approve you for something that's really small purchases. But a hard inquiry are the ones that will affect your credit score because now we're talking about a major purchase. So keep those two in mind when, you, when, you, when we're looking at uh, uh, new credit. And then types of credit used, uh, you know, having a diversified mix of different credit is a good thing. Uh, just make sure you're careful with the revolving accounts and make sure that, you know, mortgage is probably one of the best credits to have to be able to reflect on your credit score. But revolving accounts and things like that need to be very, very careful with. OK, uh, but again, this is how your credit score is put together based on those factors. Uh, in debt to income, uh, imagine your credit again, we're talking debt to income ratio. Now the average debt to income ratio roughly is about, for a household is about roughly 29%, I believe. Everyone has a different ratio. You just have to figure it out and calculate it. There's ways to calculate that. 
but kind of keep in mind that that is going to be looked at closely again. For example, if you're going to buy a house, how much money you have versus how much money you owe versus how much money you're asking for, right? So your debt to income ratio becomes a big factor there as well. Uh, one of the benefits that service members and families have are is the Service Member Civil Relief Act, okay? This is a great tool. It talks to your right as a service member and the benefits you get being a service member. Uh, one of them would be on any pre-service debt that you have, uh, they're gonna bring that interest down to 6%. That's, pretty, that's a pretty decent tool to have in your, in your workshop. There are other things in there within the SDRA, but that's a nice tool to have. So again, pre, pre, uh, pre-military income. So if you're already in the military and you accrue that, it is what it is, but it's prior to uh, the military. Is that correct, JJ? Yeah. So pre-active duty. So for, for example, I was telling you my story a little bit in, in, in 04 to 06, I got mobilized. And so debt that I had, even though I had been active duty 14 years earlier, all the debt I had that I had accrued while I was a civilian or, or, or at least a, a reservist that was eligible when I was called to duty. So sometimes people will, uh, from a deployment standpoint and there are certain, certain, companies that will provide some sort of deployment benefits, but it's really the active duty is the trigger. So that's right, Joel. All right. So, and another key factor in this to consider is that you also have other rights as well. For example, if you, uh, you know, when it comes to legal things in, in terms of uh, uh, if you're renting a property and you get deployed or you get orders early, SCRA gives you that that uh, leverage to be able to get out of those leases and those agreements based on that. And typically it's associated with a military clause, but you'll see that uh, if you read through there, it helps you cancel residential or auto leases and uh, you know, other legal proceedings within SC SCRA that you could use. Uh, recommend uh, one of the places to go to that you can actually read through is militaryonesource.mil. They have it all in there and you can read through that. Uh, so let's talk about eliminating debt a little bit, you know, building small cash cushion and, and stop using credit. Uh, you know, we talk about an emergency fund. An emergency fund typically is about three to six months of your normal living expenses. That probably needs to be one of the first priorities before you do anything. And you want to build to that. One of the recommendations we've seen across the board is take a, a, at least to $1,000 and build to $1,000 and have that in a small, low interest savings account and just mark it, like JJ said, maybe even label it emergency fund and just drop the money in there and slowly build to that money. It doesn't have to be $1,000 right away. There are other benefits you get if you're on seized duty or you know, hazardous duty or any of those extra pays that you can take. Or even when there's a promotion or, or, or pay raise at the beginning of the year, maybe set an allotment to the side, put that in and start building on that emergency fund. Uh, that is something that's going to be coming in very handy for you because inevitably at some point, when your husband or your spouse or your wife deploys, you're going to find yourself in a situation where something breaks and you're going to need that money now. But again, I caution you, that is break glass of emer in case of emergency money, right? Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Build yourself. Get, get some discipline within yourself just to not touch that money. Uh, so we talk about building small cash. That's an example of that. Cutting or limiting expenses to free up cash. As you work your budget and you start looking at what you're spending, you're going to find that there are going to be areas that you go, you got to be kidding me. I use the example of a girl that went to Starbucks every day that found out that she was spending almost $300 a month in Starbucks. Uh, and by the time she did her budget and reevaluated things, you know, she was making a whole lot more coffee at home or going to Wawa and getting the dollar cup of coffee versus the three or four dollar cup of coffee every day. So, you know, it didn't change anything. She was still very happy. She was still getting her caffeine. But at the end of the day, I realized that she was spending a whole lot of money somewhere and not getting a return on that money. So kind of keep that in mind, too, when you build your budget. You're going to find little wickets in there and go, wow, am I really spending that much? It's a good tool to use. Uh, we talked about, you know, how you can help yourself, too, in your FICO score. Well, paying off high interest debt first is a good tool. Let's just say you have, a, I don't know, cut two or three credit cards. One of them is at about 11%, another one has a 9 another one is 6%. You want to take and you want to pay the minimum, maybe a little bit more on those low interest ones, right? But on the high interest card, now keep in mind, you work the budget, you work the plan, you know what you can put into that, right? You take and you max out as much of that payment that you can on that high interest card. Once you pay that off, take that amount that you were putting towards that high interest card and bring it down to the next high interest card. Pay that off quickly 
And then once you're done with that one, bring it down to the lowest interest card that you had and pay that off. Uh, they verb that they, they articulate that as power payment, right? It's a good way to get credit cards down fast and pay less money on interest. And it's a good tool to kind of keep your FICO score massage. And then now, like most people will tell you, reevaluate. Did you really need three credit cards? Okay, and maybe that wasn't a smart move to begin with. So now you kind of reevaluate, keep the low interest card, and use that wisely to keep your FICO score going. But more importantly, I will tell you, the paradigm in the military for many years, at least probably when JJ and I were in, was if you ask help, it was viewed as a sign of weakness. I'm here to tell you that that is not true anymore. The military wants you to ask for help. In fact, corporate America will tell you, if you need help, ask for it. Uh, don't be the silent person or suffer in silence. If there's problems and you need help, there are many people out there. You have Navy Marine Corps Relief Society, you know, Army, uh, Army Relief Funds, all kinds of stuff out there and institutions that will help you. In within your own commands, you may find that you have uh, financial uh, uh, command financial specialists that will help you as well. So use those tools to your advantage and seek the free services that are out there to help you, you know, set those budgets up and guide you to financial success. Uh, managing your credit debt, we're talking about paying more than a minimum. I said, we talked about that earlier. We said, hey, if you pay the minimum, you're going to, and I, I joke around, I tell people, if you pay the minimum, you're going to be paying till Moses parts water again, so to speak. So you need to be careful with that. In this case, we're talking about a $2,500 purchase. You're paying the minimum balance, the minimum percentage on that balance, which in this case would be $15 at a hypothetical 18% interest rate. So $2,500 TV. 18%, you're only paying $15 a month. It's going to take you about 27 years to pay off. And when you're done paying it off, you've paid them $6,000 in interest. Does that even make sense? Yeah. <laughs> However, if you go back and reevaluate, work your budget, get a strategy in place and say, you know what, I'm going to pay, and let's just say $100 this case. It may be 25, maybe 50, whatever the case is. Understand that the number that you put in there, one, will bring down the number of months, and two, will also bring down the amount of interest that you've given back on that, because that is a loan. It's a loan, essentially, on that loan, okay? So again, an example would be paying $100 a month. You take that from 27 years to 32 months, less than three years, and you've only given them $657 back in interest. Okay. That's a great illustration of avoiding the minimum payments. So kind of put that in perspective, you know, there's nothing wrong with making the minimum payment if that's what you can afford at the time, but find a way within your budget, look at the numbers closely and find a way within a budget to be able to say, Hey, I can pay more than the minimum. I'm going to get this down. Keeping in mind that that's $6,000 over 27 years. Is ridiculous. And, and to put it in perspective, let's talk about a person that starts as an E1. By the time they retire, 30 years of service, they just finished paying off that TV that they purchased as an E1. Let's put that in perspective. That's, that's scary. It is very scary, but that's what they want you to do. So again, help yourself a little bit. And if you need advice on that, that personal, that, that financial advice. All right, so we're going to talk about the protection and insurance piece a little bit here. Uh, again, the reason you get insurance, right, is to make sure that you don't leave your loved ones behind with any uh, financial uh financial burdens, to be able to pay off the mortgages, to pay off any loans, to pay off the things that, that are already out there that you had prior to uh, you departing. You don't want to leave them with all that. So it is pretty much a necessary evil, right, so to speak. So you have to get that insurance. Uh, so make sure you take those steps to protect, your, you know, protect yourself and protect your family. And certainly to protect your identity, too, through uh, uh, identity theft. That's a, that's a very big thing that's happened out there. We're going to talk about a uh, a couple of things there about that, but we're also going to tell you where you can go to help yourself a little bit uh, with regard to identity theft. So some of the stuff to consider when you get auto insurance are these factors right here, your location. And, and we talk about something, an example would be something like Manhattan, New York and versus Manhattan, Kansas, right? Uh, certainly in Manhattan, New York, you're probably going to see higher theft, Higher, and I'm from New York, so I can say that, okay? Higher theft and, uh, and other things going on there that probably would increase your level of risk with your vehicle, so your insurance may be a little higher. An area like Manhattan, Kansas, a little small town, you may not see that as much, so insurance may cost you less. The type of vehicle you drive, absolutely. If you're driving a practical vehicle, and you heard me use that earlier, a practical vehicle, chances are that you're gonna pay about 60% less in insurance than a person that wants to drive the extravagant, 
go fast vehicle or high cost vehicles. Okay. And I'm saying high cost, like very extravagant. Uh, driving record is a factor, of course. If you have speeding tickets, any accidents, again, your risk goes up because your risk goes up, your insurance cost is going to go up, your premiums are going to go up. So you want to try to do the best you can not to be, you know, accidents do happen. The idea is that you don't want to be the one at fault. Uh, policy limits. Think about your policy limits when you're, when you're working, uh, getting an insurance policy. More importantly, don't settle for the state minimums. A lot of times you'll hear me talk to service members and one of the, uh, I'll hear them talk about, hey, I got the state minimums. I, I'm good to go. Well, let's talk about a state minimum. A state minimum for an accident to one person was probably about $25,000. An accident for uh, the minimum coverage that they have set on the policy. Uh, an accident with two or three people involved or more, they set their, their minimum to 50000 And then liability, maybe 100000 or 300000 that might be okay in that area, but those two, 25 and 50, where you have an accident with one person, consider the fact that if you were at fault and that person got injured pretty bad, uh, is $25,000 going to be enough to cover all those expenses? Because what I want you to think about is once that $25,000 is paid out by the insurance company, you're liable for anything above that. The insurance company has done their job. They paid what you put on that policy. The same thing for an accident with two or more or three people in a car. If that happens and the 50000 is in there and you met that fifty cap and there's more expenses, they're coming after you and in most cases will try to sue you for, your, for that money. So kind of be very cognizant of that when you set your, your uh, policy limits and think about that. It's pennies on the dollar to increase it to a level that you're comfortable with. You just have to know and work your budget and understand where you can set those limits to. But uh, maybe... The, maybe the minimums are not the best way to go. Uh, deductibles. So this is a big one too amongst uh, mostly junior sailors that I've seen and Marines and soldiers out there. They set their deductible to $1,000 so they can have a lower premium. Makes sense if you've taken and put some money in a low interest savings account where you can pull that $1,000 from when the car gets wrecked. Because at the end of the day, if you have to pay on that deductible, uh, and it's a thousand dollars, and you don't have a thousand dollars. That car is not coming out of that place, that facility. And oh, by the way, if you don't get out within a certain time, they start charging you storage fees for the vehicle. So you kind of got to think about that too. So set those numbers to where you're comfortable with. Typically, a five hundred dollar deductible. If you need to do it for less, yeah, your premium will be a little higher. But again, it's you have to weigh that into your budget and see where you're at. Makes absolutely no sense. So, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so it makes absolutely no sense to have that kind of deductible if you can't get the car out of the shop. So kind of keep that in mind. Uh, so here, your financial responsibility, absolutely. Your budget comes into play. Uh, your FICO score comes into play when you're taking a look at car insurance or anything like that. Again, if you're a low risk, then you're going to probably get a pretty decent rate. If you're a high risk, then those rates are probably going to increase a little bit when it comes to insurance. You have tickets or anything like that. Again, add that in with your financial responsibilities. You're probably going to be paying a whole lot if you're in the, in the negative. So keep that consideration in place too when, you, when you're applying for insurance. Now, this is a biggie here that I want to talk about because I want everybody to understand. I, we know, and, and we've discussed this in the last one before, Lincoln Military Housing does offer you the opportunity to get insurance, and they cap you off at $10,000. It's a good coverage to have, absolutely. But think about it if you're above that. And, and, again, it's not a mandatory thing to have, but it's a highly encouraged thing that they have and they offer you. And more noteworthy, and Brooke and I talked about this earlier, is that Lincoln Military Housing is, is one of the only – housing units that actually offer that type of coverage, which is a yeah. very, very big bonus. Is that correct, Brooke? That's correct. We actually, um, at no cost to our residents, um, we provide up to $10,000 in personal property contents coverage. So that's automatic when you live with us. That is awesome. So again, for a young service member staying at PPV, maybe that $10,000 is, is good coverage for them. But if you have a little bit more than that, whether you live in housing or whatever the case is, then you need to consider perhaps getting a renter's insurance. And I will tell you, this is the most underutilized item out there. Uh, it says no legal requirement to get it in most places. If you're out in town and you're going to rent 
uh, uh, an off-base rental, then most likely you're going to have to have renter's insurance. The cost is typically anywhere from twelve to twenty-five dollars, depending on on the, uh, the coverage that you're getting. Uh, but I will tell you that it covers uniforms. It covers a lot of items that you typically don't have. If you're PCSing, relocating from one installation to the other, that renter's insurance coverage will follow you as long as you let them know. Uh, if you have your stuff in storage, renter's insurance will cover as well. Uh, some of what affects the cost will be the amount of coverage you have, obviously, and certainly the type of coverage. So when you get renter's insurance, you want to look at, hey, I just bought a $1,200 TV today. I have renter's insurance policy. It's on my policy. I'm going to stay with the non-depreciated value, uh, replacement value, because if something happens to that TV two, three years from now, I don't want to get what, the, what it depreciated to. I want to get what I paid for it. So again, it may cost you a little extra, but certainly you'll know you had that full coverage on that TV and, and other items as well. But the two major things that it does cover is your personal property, which is all your stuff, which includes uniforms. And then if someone else tries to sue you, which is the liability aspect of that. Now, if your husband deployed or your wife deploys or your significant other deployed and they have a laptop or an iPad or anything like that that's in that policy, well, it gets replaced as well. So it's covered hey, in that. Hey, Joel. Yes, sir. There are a couple of questions for uh, Brooke regarding that, uh, the, the uh, renter's insurance that Lincoln offers. Okay. Can you, Brooke, do you want to talk about it? Or are you, are you looking? Yeah, I can, I can reply on there and um, we can certainly include in this deck what our rat card is that talks about all of our insurance information. Um, so that's not a problem at all. So uh, we do, as I mentioned, the, um, any resident with us, whether it's an on installation or off installation. Um, so again, if you're if you're a resident of Lincoln's, um, it's the personal property contents coverage is up to ten thousand. So we do encourage residents to have additional renters insurance. That's always important because uh, ten thousand dollars does not go very far, and we have units sometimes that are, um, you know, we've had residents. Uh, that live in a townhome and their neighbors had a fire or something and it impacted their items. And so um, they've, they've seen very quickly how quickly that $10,000, um, what it does cover. And so we do encourage them to have the additional on top of the 10,000 we offer them when they move in with us. And, and one of the, one of the attendees asked if, if, if you're, what, what is primary, the, the renter's insurance they got from a, a commercial company or or the one they have with as part of your contract do you, do you know that one or is that something you'd have to look at yeah i'm gonna have to look into that but we will absolutely get you that answer um cool. and put that back out with the with the deck so you had to get at least one curve Brooke. You couldn't i know escape. that's okay you're making sure i'm paying attention it's okay <laughs> <laughs> all right so that's a we'll get back to you appreciate the questions because we want to make sure everybody gets the answers to their questions so we will take care of that for that's sure. A, that's actually a very good question. I'd love to get some feedback on that too, you know, if you don't mind. Uh, so, so again, renter's insurance, it's one of the most underutilized things out there. Think about it. It's, it doesn't cost much. It's one of the probably most inexpensive insurances you can get. And the coverage is pretty significant too. So uh, we'll get the answer on the other question there. But again, something to really think about. And uh, we talk about this with all the sailors, marines, and soldiers, and, and, and can't stress that enough to them. So we'll talk about a little bit about life insurance too, right? Again, you got to get it because you want to take care of people. So we kind of use the, uh, you know, we use the acronym LIFE, right? LIFE, uh, the life after you to pay off your existing liabilities if something happens to you or, or for your family, right? It provides income under the I. It provides income for surviving family members. Uh, the F, uh, providing funds for final expenses. Now you have, uh, and we'll talk about the other options that you have there. And certainly the E is providing funds for education expenses and all the goals you might have. SGLI is a great, great policy. Uh, you know, for, for the $400,000, you get in a term life policy with that for the $25 to $29 a month you pay. Uh, it's a good policy to have, but understand that it also ends after 120 days uh, once you leave the service. So while you're in the service, it's good coverage because it gives the service member 400000 coverage. The spouse is covered to $100,000, and each child is covered to $10,000 on the coverage. Great, great policy to have, but it's always a good consideration to have that supplemental if you need it. You have to crunch some numbers. There's online calculators that'll help you do that, and you have to determine whether you want to go permanent in term. Now, you know, permanent, 
is 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 okay to have. Uh, I will tell you, it's it's pretty much you know insurance is a temporary thing that you're gonna have. Uh, so uh, when you buy insurance under the the, the permanent, you got to remember that you know it, it goes by names like whole life, universal, and variable. Uh, I'm not an insurance agent, so I won't try to tell you what's best. But I will tell you that uh, most people uh, will buy insurance are 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 gonna probably go with the term policy because it's best covered. Uh, as an inexpensive policy for the most part. So kind of keep that consideration when you're looking at insurance and what works best for you. Uh, all right, so identity theft, we talked about that a minute ago. You know, one of the biggest things that's out there that's still happening, and, and I mentioned this earlier today, is, you know, in identity theft, I asked a question about where do people think that it happens the most? And the question, the answer came out as different, hey, computers, uh, online, uh, mail scams. Yeah, they're all legit. They do happen. They happen via postal. They happen during Wi-Fi traps. There are little phishing documents that they send you. But I can tell you that to this day, I would say that we're still having a big problem with trash. People just throwing stuff in the trash, taking and shred and not shredding the documents, you know, invest in a good cross cut shredder, the documents with your name and information on there. Always a good idea just to go ahead and shred them up so you don't have that. I mean, we're certainly not in the Cold War days where back in the old days they were diving dumpsters and picking stuff out, but that wouldn't see surprise me if it was still happening either. So invest into something good and make sure that you're protecting yourself. If an email comes from a banking institution telling you that they want you to plug in some information so they can verify you, that's not what banking institutions do. Typically, they'll send you a letter that says, please come and visit us at the office, or you may get a call or an email that says, we need you to come and visit us at one of our offices to discuss some problems or concerns. But no, they won't ask you for that information online. So be very weary of that. Be very careful with that. Yes, the online traps are out there. Look at those emails very closely. Typically, you'll find an error in them. Uh, and, and you can identify and say, hey, this isn't right. And it doesn't feel right, bottom line. Call your banking institution and ask them if they sent you the letter or if they sent you that email. And you may find that they're going to tell you, no, we did not. We don't do that. So uh, some other ways to, to help yourself are through credit monitoring. Uh, you can do credit freezes. Uh, if you go online, most banking institutions let you go into the site right there when you log in and just freeze your cards or freeze your accounts so nothing else can happen. That's a great tool to have. You can set up active duty alerts. Uh, that will kind of ping on your phone if there's a purchase on a card or something. It will ask you, hey, was this you that made the purchase? Uh, and you can set those thresholds to whatever you want as well. A good tool to have is that uh, going to visit identitytheft.gov. And there's many, many tools in there that will teach you how to protect yourself. A great one that I found that I use is authenticating my uh, credit report. So if someone wants to run a credit check on me, they have to authenticate before they even get access to, to my information. Uh, and if they don't have, they get access, great. I get a ping and it lets me know if I don't, if they don't get access, I also get a warning that someone tried to uh, access my report. So again, different strategies. And you know, at the end of the day, I know this seems so tedious and painful sometimes and, and you have to do it, but you know, when money starts to accumulate at the other end, so you have that one and maybe the zero start to pile up, uh, you probably want to have these things in place to protect yourself because Several things can happen from this, right? Identity theft can cause some questions within your own establishment where you work, especially if, you know, you lose your clearance because somebody said that you charged up stuff and weren't paying or whatever the case. So many things can happen from this. So why not protect yourself, get away from those possibilities and maybe help yourself a little bit. Uh, here we go. So we're talking about the saving and investing piece now. And really, I want to kind of get everybody's attention on it because I, I like what we talk about here and I think it's smart stuff that we're going to talk to you about and I kind of want you to think about uh, your financial security, right? Because saving and investing are two different things, but they are part, they, they have to be part of your plan. Uh, so when you think save, it's money you're setting aside for short term, uh, for short term means maybe like emergency fund or dollars set aside to go on a vacation. Uh, investing is about taking risks, right? So one of the things you'll find that when you start doing an investment plan, most financial advisors, when they're working with you, are going to ask you if you have an emergency fund and they're going to ask you how you built it up. If you have the three to six months or what amount is in there, because understand when you invest, there is a risk involved. And if the market were to crash, you're going to have that emergency fund to be able to fall back on and sustain uh, your budget and do the things you need to do. So, you know, understand that saving is for short term stuff and investing is for long term goals, right? 
So when we talk about saving and investing, uh, you have to create a plan, right? And the biggest thing here is setting up a plan to pay yourself first. And uh, financial advisor will tell you, you know, saving and investing uh, 10 to 15% of your gross pay is kind of the strategy that you want to go with provided that you have, again, that emergency fund to protect you a little bit in case the market crashes. Uh, payroll deduction, making regular and automatic payments into it. So you have to be regular with it, right? Continue to make those investments or paying yourself first. Making it automatic is just as critical. One of the best means to do that is making that allotment. Over time, you'll find that you start that allotment, let's just say right now as an E4, or E5, or E6, whatever the case is. The next promotion cycle, that money you started investing into that won't be as, won't really be as impactful as, as that pay raise that you got. Now you got a nice pay raise. Maybe take some of that pay raise and direct some of that money towards that investment and let it grow and work for you. So always take a look at that. But starting early is the key. And certainly having those allotments in place that can keep it going for you is always going to be a good thing. Now, systematic investing means that you're just being consistent, right? You're investing at a fixed amount each week, each month, each pay period. You're making sure that that X amount goes in there and you're, it's almost like a religious thing. You want to make sure it gets done. And again, you'll see as the money increases, as things start to happen, that that's going to pay off for you. Uh, during periodic promotions, you know, some some stuff that you get during deployments while you're out there for six, seven, eight months, those are opportunities to increase that stuff and put that money to work for you for the future. And you have to stay goal oriented. Uh, you know, having goals is a critical element of your financial plan, bottom line. And in order to determine whether you save and invest, you need to be saving and investing. Uh, you need to really stay for, I'm sorry, you need to be in there saving and investing all the time. So uh, as we, you know, as we get ready to talk about investing, just you know, think about this plan. Think about those things, staying regular, staying automatic, making sure that it's systematic, and always be focused on the goal. Again, paying yourself first. That is the goal, and that is the intent here. So when we talk about saying investing, the first step we talked about, we talked about this earlier. We said the emergency fund, right? We said, hey, three to six months of your normal, li li uh, of your normal living expenses. Uh, depending on what stage you are in life, I would say, you know, six months is probably the best idea for most cases, right? When I was getting ready to retire, I made sure that I was built up to six months or more because, again, I was have to go out in corporate America and find a job, and I don't know what was going to happen between then and now, and I wanted to make sure that I had a little security as I went into that and gave me some peace of mind. I was able to pay all my bills and take care of business uh, like I needed to during that time frame. But why do you need to do that, you know? inevitably, like I said, even if you do or you don't deploy, something is going to break. Unfortunately, a lot of times it happens when that deployment is coming and your significant other has gone and now you've got to do this alone. Well, you put that money aside. You had it in that, in that low interest account. Now you're able to pull that money out, take care of those car maintenance, the home repairs, anything that comes up. Unplanned trips. Sometimes there's situations where you have to take a trip because, you know, whether it be a death in the family or someone that you need to go visit or something that came up, now you have that money to be able to make that trip. Tax snafus. You know, it happens to every one of us. Sometimes at, at some point in, we get a letter from the IRS that says, hey, you know, we paid you too much. You need to pay this back. And if you don't get it back to us in this certain time frame, we're going to add these penalties and interest on it. Well, now you've got that money. You just pay it back and now you have peace of mind. And then you re-engage building your emergency fund again. And certainly the insurance deductibles. So the mention of that I made earlier was, you want that thousand dollar deductible, that's great, but make sure that you have that money within an emergency fund in case you need to repair that car uh, and get that car out of the shop. So you know, it kind of balances out a little bit, but if you don't, then make sure you work that deductible to a limit, uh, uh, a reasonable number that you can work with. So we talked about the how much, right? Three to six months of your normal living expenses, starting smaller is that thousand dollars, right? And then make it automatic. Make it something that way you go, okay, I started, I got $1,000 in there now. I'm just going to set a small allotment of 20, 15, whatever you want to put in there to get it to build up. But discipline yourself not to touch that money as you move forward. So let's talk about the safety investment and, and, and the benefits of starting early. In this illustration, you're going to see uh, how at 32 years old, the person started to the age of 65. And this is all hypothetical, but the market, you know, they had a 7% return on the money uh, and it was $500 a month from the age 32 to 65. That person retired at age 65, retired with about $713,000 in the bank. 
uh, in that investment, right? That's not a bad deal. That's not bad. But consider your lifespan. Consider your family genetics. I know I, with me, there's family that have lived to 95, 100 years old. Uh, and, you know, the question I, I would ask myself, would $700,000 be good from age 65 to 100, which is another 35 years, based on the economy, based on the moving targets out there with money and all that, would that be good for me? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Maybe I have to put some new lifestyle changes in place to even to be able to sustain life uh, to that number, to that 100 years old. So uh, assuming that I'm going to live 100 years old, and I hope to, uh, I think that's something that you really have to consider. But, you know, think about that. But think about this here, a person that started at age 22, 10 years earlier, investing the same amount of money, only 10 years earlier because they had a strategy put into place. Now, mind you, this is a $500 a month illustration. You can put other numbers in there and still build because the idea here is start early, whatever level you want to get to. But let's just use the illustration of $500 a month. In this case, the person retired with almost $1.5 million. Now I'm thinking at age 65 to 100, $1.5 million is going to carry me over pretty comfortably, I think. Uh, So that's a perspective that we kind of want you to understand here. Hypothetical 7%, the S&P index fluctuates, the market fluctuates. You know, I think over the last 90 plus years, we were fortunate to get about 10% out of it. I don't know where we're going to be at now for a little while, but certainly 7%, I think is a pretty safe number for the most part. Uh, But again, who knows? The market moves a lot. But in this case, 7%, $500 a month invested over that period of time, that young man or young lady that started right there is going to have, it's going to be over uh, $1.5 million. So again, something to look at, something to kind of look at the illustration, but I think it's a good illustration to show to you that that discipline thing starting early will pay off. Now, that's not to say that you can't start a little later in the game. The idea here is to get in there and do something. And that's kind of what we really want to make sure you understand is get in there and start doing something now so that you can build for the future, build for your children, build for your family. Uh, Low risk savings, some low risk savings to think about. They're all short term, right? Uh, You have savings accounts, which are low interest, money market accounts, which are kind of a, a higher interest savings account, so to speak, and CDs, which yield a little bit more than savings and savings bonds, which are kind of a loan to the government uh, and that, that are actually over a period of time. They don't yield a whole lot, but they are long-term. Uh, but again, in most cases with these, they're liquid and they're safe, meaning that you can, the money's going to be there. And if you pull the money out, you're going to get your money back. Uh, some things like a CD, uh, you know, one of the ones that I have is if I pull the money out early, I think 90 days of the earnings I'm not going to get, but the rest I will get. So there's, there's different strategies that we'll look at there. But in most cases, this is safe, okay? Uh, the one that I want you to think about, all of these yield, have you lower returns except for this program right here, Savings Deposit Program. Now, Savings Deposit Program is a DFAS program. It's run by DFAS. It's a defense financing agency. They're the people that cut the checks to the military, right, and send the pay. Uh, what I want you to remember about this program is that DFAS says that when you deploy and you go into a combat zone, after being in the combat zone, which designated the combat zone for 30 days, after 30 days, you're able to contribute up to $10,000 while you're in the combat zone. Now, there's a, there's a specific way you go about that, and they tell you how to do that. Uh, I don't know the formula, the mix, but they're based on pay grades and some other stuff, some variables in there. But let's just say you're in the combat zone. After 30 days, you're in the combat zone long enough to get that to that $10,000. Anywhere along there, if you come out of the combat zone, the contributions stop. You can no longer contrib- contribute. But while you're in the combat zone, you can contribute up to $10,000. you are going to get a guaranteed 10% APR of 10%. Guaranteed 10% APR on that. Now, that continues the rest of the deployment after you've come out of the combat zone. And once you return home, it continues an additional 90 days. So that's not a bad deal. You have to wait 30 once you're in the combat zone. But once you get home, you're still got another 90 days of earnings of that 10%. So it's a great program. Uh, if uh, I had no idea it existed for many, many years. I wish I would have known about it earlier, having been in several combat deployments. Uh, but I will tell you that it is a great tool for making a little additional money. After 90 days, DFAS will contact you and say, hey, I need you to get this money out now. 
or they will offer you options on how you can move that money around to other stuff. Uh, or you could just take it out and reinvest it into something else, maybe build your emergency fund. So there are options there. Uh, great, great tool to use. Here are your higher risk investments, uh, medium and long term, right? So when we start talking about stocks, we talk about, you know, you're investing in a company, uh, hoping to get some type of return over a long period of time. Bonds, like we talked about, is a higher risk. It's long term. And real estate, you know, it's always a moving target. Uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes not so good, but it, it fluctuates. The market fluctuates, so you kind of got to be watching that very closely. Uh, mutual funds uh, seem to be the best ones to go with nowadays, and the reason is because you have several aspects with it. Uh, with it. It's, it's a diversified fund, meaning that it goes into one mutual fund and is spread out amongst different investments. Uh, it's a good idea to have it professionally managed, especially if you're in the military, because I can't think of any sailor marine soldier that's going to sit at his computer during work hours and move money around and play with the market so uh, i know that when i was a leader and i was leading my own commando detachment that wasn't going to happen unless you were doing school work so have it professionally managed is a good idea because you can ask those tough questions and ask hey why is this here what's moving around why is this why is this line tracking so low when is it going to come back up and there's no silly questions when it comes to that when you speak to them uh, there are some access, uh, uh, you know, there's some money to access into the investments. Usually they're pretty low funds, but more importantly, be aware of the expenses associated with those mutual funds. You get a prospectus report that comes out every quarter uh, annually. Uh, take a look at that, read it. You know, like I tell a lot of the service members, you read maintenance manuals, you read standard operating procedures, you read rules of engagement, you read all that stuff to know how to do your job. Why not read all this thing when it comes to real life and living your life? So take the time to look through all those. And at the end of the day, when you have a question, ask that person that's working it for you, that's professionally managed it for you. Make that call. Here's a good uh, example, a very simple illustration of what's called dollar cost averaging. And if you take a look at it, uh, the numbers here at 20, you know, when the market was up, a person, uh, this particular person was, was investing $500 a month, right, for a uh, specific period of time. And the shares were at $17. And here, when the, when the market was high, they kind of tailored off a little bit, maybe made a few purchases. But when the market came down a little lower, they purchased a whole lot more. And as it got lower and lower, they went in and invested more money into it and purchased more shares. So over the longevity of this, the, or during this whole time frame, the person purchased 361 shares and probably had a whole lot more than the people decided not to do anything when the market came down a little bit. That's kind of an, a hypothetical example of a dollar cost averaging. You know, they say buy low. That's probably a good idea in most cases. And again, some of these decisions are based on your discussions with your financial advisor, sitting down and talking it through and say, hey, what do you think? How's it tracking? What's the history? Uh, and then you make those decisions based on that as well. Again, the early bird gets the worm like we talked about. Some uh, other items to consider with saving and investing are your thrift savings plan. Uh, and, and most of you know that there's a BRS now for those that came in after uh, January 1st of 2018. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But under the traditional TSP, which is meant to be like a 401k, it's, it's basically the employer provided retirement plan. There's a traditional and a raw. The difference is a simple, right? With a, tra with a traditional... Uh, fund, you're going to invest into that fund. And then at age 59 and a half, you have to start taking out contributions. And when you start taking out contributions, you're going to find that you have to pay taxes on that money. Okay. With a Roth IRA or a Roth, Roth feature, rather, you're going to go ahead and pay the taxes up front and all the earnings are going to be yours because you've paid the taxes at the current tax bracket you're in. When you pull the money out, it doesn't have to be at age 59 and a half. You can pull a little bit then if you want to, or just wait and pull it out pretty much anytime you want. You've already paid the interest on that money. Now you can contribute up to $19,500 annual. And if you're over 50, you can contribute another, an additional $6,500. That's called a catch up is what they call it. Uh, under the traditional IRA, uh, if you take a look at that, it's set up, you know, it's also uh, under the IRA, there's also the traditional and the Roth feature. The contribution went up from $5,500 to $6,000 annually. And then you can contribute if you're over 50 up to another $1,000. So similar to that, similar to the TSP, 
uh, again, but the uh, contribution limits are a little smaller. Now, some advantages of TSP, if there's other special pays or other stuff involved there, you can also contribute those special pays into the CS TSP program. And again, this talks about it a little bit. It's a tax advantage employer account. Uh, it's all done via payroll deduction. So it's automatically comes out of your pay, pay and you can see that uh, on, on the LES, a leave and earning statement, it'll show up on there. Uh, some of the low cost investment options are gonna be in there. Uh, you know, uh, what used to be a default to what's called the G fund, uh, the government fund, is now a default to the life cycle funds. And they did that because essentially the money that went into the G fund, nothing really ever happened with it. It's very, very low, low risk. So there was nothing really moving in that fund. With At least with the life cycle, it gives you an opportunity to plan out your retirement at the 20, the 40 year mark and, and be at a certain place that you wanna be. Uh, the fund itself are the G, F, C, S, and I. And the G fund, like I said, is a, is a non-marketable government securities, right? Uh, and it's a very low return, low yielding on that. On the F fund, you're talking about, uh, it's an aggregated bond index, uh, you know, performance is based on the Bloomberg Barclays uh, index. Uh, the C fund is also an index fund, and it kind of mirrors the S&P index, what we call the Standard & Poor's Index, S&P 500. And that's gonna be larger US stocks uh, when you go into the uh, the, uh, uh, the S fund, you're talking about Dow Jones. You're talking about the stock market index. Uh, and the I funds are international. And then the L funds, like I said, are the life cycle funds. Under the BRS, there's a 5% contribution that comes from DOD. They will match a person's contributions to TSP to 5%. And again, during deployment opportunities, when there's more money, that come in like sea service pay, hazardous duties pay, you can contribute that to that as well. And we'll talk a little bit about TSP upon separation. I want you to kind of keep this in mind that when you separate from the military service, unless you're working for the federal government again, uh, you're not gonna be able to contribute to TSP anymore. So you have options. You can leave the money in there and because you're not working for the government or federal government anymore, whatever's in there, the way you have it allocated to play out, will play out. You can no longer contribute to it, but what's in there will continue to, to, to roll around in whatever you have, an L fund, the I fund, uh, or, or the S fund, or whatever case. Uh, you can choose to withdraw all or part of that money, but there are penalties and, and fees associated with that because now you're taking that money out early, right? Uh, or you could take the option at no cost to transfer, roll over, roll over that money into, into an IRA or your, or your current or your new employer plan. So when you get out of service and you get a job and they have a plan there, you can take that money and roll it in there. I did that with mine. A few forms, get it notarized, do it, and then it's, it's done electronically. Again, when you do that, you'll be speaking to a financial person that's going to ask you certain questions like emergency fund and all that too. They did that with me. And what my goals are because you have to have those goals. Under the BRS, BRS, so it talks about who's affected. Who's affected is anyone that came in from January 1st, 2000 or later automatically goes under the BRS system. If you came in prior to that, uh, then you had an option to stay under the legacy or convert to BRS, the blended retirement system. Some of the, uh, some of the uh, details of the system is, hey, you know, when you go to retire on the BRS, if you uh, take BRS, understand that if you do 20 years of service under the old retirement plan or the legacy plan, you, you held a rank for three years before you retire, you're going to make 50% of that base pay for the rest of your life upon retirement. On the BRS, it's now been reduced to 40%. Now, I wouldn't look at that so negatively because at the end of the day, that's a guaranteed 40% for the rest of your life. So you still have options, okay? That was just the DOD uh, intention. And part of that is because DOD under the new BRS, what it allows is a person that leaves a military service early will have some level of money in an account for them or some money put away that can, they could potentially use if they need to. Before, under the old system, you really didn't have that. Uh, uh, some of the TSP, you'll be able to contribute to it. There's a partial lump sum option. So the partial lump sum option is described as this. Upon retirement, you have the option of taking up to 50%, 25 or 50% of your retirement pay up front. If you take that, understand that that's what your retirement is going to be reduced by as well. And if it's reduced by that amount, you got to understand that that 
may take away a few options for you unless you're doing some miraculous stuff with that money, so to speak. But at the end of the day, it's going to reduce that amount from the day you retire to age 65. And at age 65, it will go back up to 40%. So consider where you're at, consider your finances when making that kind of decision. And if you can stay away from it, good. If that's something that you feel you need to do, then again, make sure you've looked at all your options. At the 12 year mark, a service member is also going to be offered an opportunity to get a bonus to stick around for four more years. That's the continuation pay aspect of the BRS. And it says, hey, if I'm a critical classification in my job, what I do, you're probably going to get about 16 to 16 and a half percent of your base pay as a bonus. If you're not so critical, the lowest portion would be about two and a half percent. They offer them to stick around for four years. In most cases, if you take that, you're going to stick around till 20 anyway. So you get that uh, continuation pay. And then at 20, when you retire, you'll stick with your 40 percent retirement. And uh, there's other options in there that you kind of need to consider. But those are pretty much the highest ones to really think about. Uh, just so you understand the matching aspect of it, with BRS, after you're in the military service, you're going to get immediately a, first, uh, a 1%, right? I think it's after 60 days. After 60 days, you're going to get 1% uh, from DOD automatic. Uh, after the second year, beginning your third year, if you put in an additional 4% to uh, uh, 5%, DOD will match you another 4%. So that means you're going to get 10% total, 5% from you, and 4% from DOD plus that additional 1% that they gave you from the beginning. So that's a 10% match in your BRS contributions, which is pretty good. Now understand that goes into a traditional feature, not Roth. They're not going to pay those taxes up front for you, but DOD is matching your five. You could put in 15, you could put in 20, but DOD will only match you to five. Still a good deal, something that we really haven't had uh, for many years, and they're trying to make that happen for you now. So the bottom line, hey, we talked about every one of these. We talked about setting those goals, right? We talked about the budget, which fuels those goals and keeps them going. And again, using the SMART acronym, think about that. Make it, uh, make it, uh, make it specific, make it measurable, make it attainable. Make sure there's stuff that you can look at along the way. Use the, the battle buddies or, or your spouse or anybody to kind of look at it with each other and, and challenge each other to meet those goals. Uh, Protection, make sure that you're thinking about identity theft. Making sure that you have those things in place to help you. Make sure you have the right insurance. Making sure you're looking at your deductibles. Do your budget. Make sure the deductibles make sense. Make sure that those limits on your policy are not just the state minimums, that they are there to protect you and help you in case you do have an accident. Saving, get that strategy in place. Make it something about paying yourself first, a saving and investment piece. You know, 10 to 15% of your gross pay, think about how you want to use that to your advantage. But more importantly, have that emergency fund in place first. That's probably the key to any of this. That will give you some level of, or at least some peace of mind as you're approaching these strategies. And last but not least, to be an effective leader, you got to lead from the front. If people see you doing these things, they're going to want to emulate you and they're going to want to be like you. So think about that when you do that. If you're doing this and you're able to talk to other people about it, you're going to be a great example to them. Uh, and that does conclude my brief. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to, to answer them. If not, I believe JJ is still on and we can answer any of your questions. JJ, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, let me uh, unmute myself there. No, no, I, th I think I'd love to answer your questions. I I've tried to keep up with them on the uh, slide. But uh, bottom line here, just like you said, Joel, is, is just, hey, let's uh, spend a little time uh, on your own thinking about this, what you're trying to accomplish in your game plan to get it done, uh, and, and essentially take charge of your money. Don't, uh, don't let it take charge of you. And that's, that's our hope. So we're glad we could spend a little bit of time with you. Yeah, it really, it really, folks, it's, it's been an honor to get on there and speak to you. I absolutely love talking about this. And again, I, I was a late bloomer, right? I told you I, that paradigm when I grew up is it wasn't about saving. I had no idea. Uh, but it took some hard lessons to get along the way. And uh, I'm glad to say that I'm in a good place now. And I hope to stay in a good place. But I had to hold, work a whole lot harder because I didn't start as early as some people that I know that are sitting in a much better place than I am. So, but it's okay. I have a plan, it's working, and I got money going into the things I need to do for my future. So again, I, I hope that that is what you aspire to do, and I, I wish you the best, and I hope you all are able to do that. Brooke, anything else? 
Well, no, uh, Joel and JJ, we here at Lincoln Military Housing truly appreciate your time today. I know that this information um, is a lot of information, so we will be sending this presentation out to everybody that's attended. Um, I do want to remind everybody that on the 21st, we're hosting our second series, which is financial wellness during a pandemic, and it will be at the same time. And so if you're interested in learning, um, like all of us, you know, how we can protect ourselves and what the best financial uh, way forward is during this unprecedented time, that is a great um, opportunity for us to get back on here and learn more from Joel and JJ. You guys are always very energetic and we appreciate um, every time I hear you all go through the presentation, I'm learning something new. So thank you so much for your time. And um, we will follow back up with questions that were unanswered specifically. I know there was an insurance question, um, but in the meantime, we'll make sure everybody has your contact information if they have uh, questions outside of this call. So thank you again. Thank you, Anna, Brooke. Thank Thanks you so much for what you guys are Appreciate doing. Appreciate it setting this up. That was awesome. Thank you. Okay. Well, we hope everybody has a great day. Stay safe and we'll talk soon. Thanks. Bye.